Welcome back to Physiology. My name is Kevin Tokoff. In this video, we're going to be doing a very broad overview of fatty acid metabolism, and we're going to continue it into the next video. So here we're going to see where the fatty acids come from, and then how we transport them in the body, and then ultimately how we get them into the cell and what happens to them once they're inside the cell. Okay, so what is the source of fatty acids? Now, we generally have two sources. It's either going to be from the GI tract, so from the diet. So, for example, we could eat a steak. Steak has fatty acids, and so those fatty acids are going to go through the GI tract and have to be absorbed into the blood, right? Or they're going to come from pre-existing fatty acids in adipose tissue, so fat cells. And we're really going to focus on the fat cells here because the GI tract is a little bit more complicated and involves the formation of a chylomicron, which itself is another video. So here's a triacylglycerol, also called a triglyceride. A triacylglycerol is basically just a storage form of fatty acids. So over here we have a glycerol backbone. Glycerol is a three-carbon molecule. And each oxygen of this glycerol is bound to a fatty acid. And so because there's three oxygens here, we can have three fatty acids bound to this glycerol. And when we have this, it's termed a triacylglycerol or a triglyceride. This is the storage form of fatty acids in adipose tissue. So if we want to metabolize these fatty acids, the fatty acids have to first be liberated from the adipose tissue. And there's a bunch of hormonal signals that will trigger this. For example, epinephrine and glucagon are two examples. But in any case, we have to activate enzymes called lipases. Lipases are enzymes that basically split the triglycerides right where this red dotted line is. Okay? So for example, if you split right here, then this 16 carbon fatty acid would come off. If you split the second one, this monounsaturated fatty acid would come off, and splitting the bottom one would release this polyunsaturated fatty acid. Okay? When you release all three of the fatty acids, you end up with just the glycerol, which is dealt with separately. But then these fatty acids that are now liberated are termed free fatty acids, or FFAs, and then they're basically released from the adipose cells, or adipocytes, into the blood. And in the blood, they're picked up by a protein called serum albumin. Albumin is the major protein in the blood that carries fatty acids. And it pretty much just carries these fatty acids liberated from adipose tissue to cells that can metabolize them. And for example, uh, the heart, skeletal muscle cells, those are good examples of cells that can metabolize fatty acids. But in order to metabolize those fatty acids, those fatty acids have to be able to enter the cell. And so we're going to look at this slide right here, which is actually from a previous video. But we have different kinds of fatty acids as shown right here. We have short-chain fatty acids, medium-chain fatty acids, long-chain, and then very long-chain fatty acids. Okay. Short-chain and medium-chain fatty acids are small enough to diffuse through the plasma membrane of cells by simple diffusion. They still require a carrier in the blood like albumin, but they can diffuse through via simple diffusion. Larger fatty acids, like long-chain and very long-chain fatty acids, require some protein transporters to get across the membrane. A couple of examples are CD36 and fatty acid transport protein. So these two proteins can transport long and very long-chain fatty acids into the cell. Okay, So now we have a fatty acid in the cell. What happens to that fatty acid? Well, as I'll go into in future videos as well, Fatty acids are extremely hydrophobic, meaning they don't like water. If you've ever done that experiment where you mix oil and water, you notice that the water all gets together, and then the fat or oil all gets together, and they separate. And so the oil sticks together. And that would be really bad if we got a bunch of fatty acids in the cell, and they all stuck together, because that's what the tendency would be. They'd form a big fat droplet, and that would actually harm the cell. We can't have that. So what we need to do is we need to somehow solubilize the fatty acid, make it soluble in the cell, because the cell is mostly water. And so to do that, we use this enzyme called fatty acyl-CoA synthetase. What this enzyme does is it attaches the coenzyme A group, which is right here. It attaches coenzyme A to the fatty acid, and that generates what we call an acyl-CoA. Okay, I'll, we'll actually look at this on this slide right here. So once inside the cell's cytoplasm, this enzyme called fatty acyl-CoA synthetase 
basically takes this oxygen right here, the fatty acid, and puts a coenzyme A on it, like this. Okay? This coenzyme A, you can Google it, but it's a very, very large molecule, and it's water-soluble. And so by putting this water-soluble molecule that's very grossly abbreviated here on this fatty acid, it makes the molecule overall water-soluble and prevents these fatty acids from congealing with each other. Okay, So fatty acid, hydrophobic, acyl-CoA, which is the derivative, is much less hydrophobic. It's actually more water-soluble. And we actually turn them acyl-CoAs. So this fatty acid over here is 16 carbons. Each one of these vertexes represents a carbon. One, two, three, four, and you can count it up to 16. This is its 16 carbon derivative termed an acyl-CoA. Once we have this acyl-CoA, we can then transport it into the mitochondrial matrix. So right now we're out here in the cytoplasm of the cell. In here is the mitochondrial matrix, and this is where beta oxidation occurs. So if we want to metabolize this fatty acid or acyl-CoA derivative, we have to somehow get it from the cytoplasm into the matrix of the mitochondria. This transport process is easier said than done. I have another video where we actually go over the mechanism of it. Uh, so for now, I'm just going to say it magically moves from the cell cytoplasm or cytosol into the mitochondrial matrix. And so now you see here the acyl-CoA has crossed both the outer and inner mitochondrial membranes. It's now in the mitochondrial matrix, which is relevant because this is where beta oxidation occurs. Beta oxidation is a pathway where the cell can actually metabolize the acyl-CoA and get a bunch of acetyl-CoAs for energy and NADHs and FADH2s, which will power the electron transport chain that we saw in a previous video. And so I'm going to leave this video right here where we have this acyl-CoA now in the matrix of the mitochondria, and we're going to look at beta oxidation in the next video. So I hope you'll join me then. So hopefully this video made sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.